Hello, readers. Welcome to 20 Questions with Your Favorite Author, where we ask authors important questions like, why would you agree to be on this podcast? I'm Kelly Lynn Colby, Editorial Director at Curse Dragon Ship Publishing. And for episode 11, we have William Allen Webb, writer of stories because actual work sucks. Except if you see how much he writes, you'll see he works his behind off. If he's not your favorite before, he will be after. too bad this time we can get this right this totally works so how are you doing bill i am doing great ma'am how are you not too bad hanging in there it actually got a little warm in houston i had to open my window over here yeah it was like 70 yesterday here uh, mm-hmm. i went out this morning i went, went outside a little while ago and uh there was a mosquito in january what yeah and tonight we're gonna have snow so that's what it's like <laughs> That's that is the winter right there. The, the, yeah. This seems to be the changing seasons. Winter is crazy like that. Yeah, we have weeds growing in the backyard already. We're like, seriously, it's January. Well, but you're in Texas, right? In Houston, no less. So well, yes. yeah. So, <laughs> that, yeah Somebody, that's a different continent. It, it almost is. It almost. It still gets too cold here, though. We need to move farther south. I'm with you. <laughs> Key West, Jamaica, you know, yeah, I'm Cayman Islands. The least, because you've got ocean on one side, mountains on the other. I mean, works come on. for me. Let's That's establish right. writers' colony. That would be perfect. I mean, they have internet. We can all work there. It'll be perfect. Yes, and who cares if they don't? <laughs> we'll make it work. We'll make yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Bill, I have a um, bio for you. So let me read that real quick. Uh, except uh, let's see, let's see how many of these names I get right. So a lot of these people I've read, but I have one of those, you know, um, reading vocabularies and I can't even say vocabulary wrong anymore. So we'll, we'll see how many of these names I get right. So Bill wrote his first stories in grade school and hasn't stopped since. By age 25, he'd read all of the classics, Robert E. Howard, Fritz Leiber, Robert Heinlein, Michael Moorcock, and Roger Zelansny. Later Zelazny. influences, I'm sorry, what was it? Zelazny. I was so close. Zelazny. Later influences include Larry Niven, Jerry Purnell, David Weber, and Larry Carrera. After multiple careers in various industries, he much prefers writing books and stories to any sort of actual work. So. And I've done actual work and it sucks. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Um, So we're going to start with one, our very famous question, and that is, where do you get your ideas? So I'm going to turn this one around. So having seen your show, I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to okay. pull a uh, Captain Kirk on you and I love uh, it. Yashi Maru. Are you going to take your shirt off? No, you really don't want that. But, well, that's uh, for Captain Kirk, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, where do I? The question for me would be, where do I get my good ideas? Oh, okay, that sounds fair. Because I get a lot of ideas, they're just not all really very good. Uh, and it, it's interesting how um, I, I personally get ideas everywhere, and I literally mean everywhere. One of the best places for me to ever get dialogue, and, and really authentic but ridiculous dialogue, is the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> I mean, one of one of the best lines I've ever gotten is, um, "I don't I don't need you with your uh, bleach blonde daddy issues hair." I don't even know what that means. But you're like, I'm using it. But like, oh, yeah, I'm stealing that. And I wrote it down immediately. (laughs) So, um, but I think everybody gets ideas from everything. I do Mm -hmm. constantly. And it's really a question of which ones are good and which ones are pursuing. I know a lot of people like to write them down in notebooks and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and they have a scratch pad so they can write it down. But I'm with Stephen King on that one. What you wind up with is all these notebooks of really bad ideas with a good one in there every now and then, Mm -hmm. but you can't find it because all you're doing is looking at all the bad ones. That's true. And so you let it it, uh, grow inside your mind, and if your mind forgets about it, then it wasn't worth writing in the first place. But if you... If you let your mind fill in those blanks around that idea, when you actually go back to it, you'll you'll have more of a story than you thought you had. Um, 
good advice. When I started writing my first book, uh, the first published novel, I just had these two very disconnected, uh, that, like, scenes in my head. I, you're a writer, so I know you've got to be familiar with this stuff. And you have a scene in your head, and it kind of plays out like this real brief video, but it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, and Especially so, if it's a dream. Well, yeah, and you wake up, and mm -hmm. you think, hmm, I wonder what that was. But if you can remember it, and it keeps occurring... Mm -hmm. One day I just sat down and I wrote these two out. I had two of them that just, they'd been bu bugging me for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they were, once I sat down and wrote them out, it turns out they were connected. But I didn't know that until I wrote them out. And there was a whole section in between that my brain had already written, but it was in my subconscious. So uh, I think for me, ideas come from everywhere. Um, and I write them down. I sometimes they even write a full scene without a book or a story for them to go into and just leave them there. I did that with one about two years ago and just three days ago figured out where it went into the new book I'm writing. So my brain knew I was going to write this book three years ago, but I didn't. Well, that's awesome. And that leads actually to another question I had was how long do you sit on an idea when you have it? Usually it's a long time. And mm -hmm. Now, I say that, but not always. Um, sometimes I will, uh, for example, on the book I'm working on, now it's a new book, and I had an idea for how to open it, and I just sat down and wrote that scene. I don't know where the rest of the book's going. I'm a complete pantser, unapologetic. And so uh, in, in the book that, um, in my main series, Last Brigade, which is the first series I started writing, and I've already written the ending for it. I just don't know what the rest of the book is. <laughs> You're like, but I know it ends here. Well, that's I know the tough this part, is what's going to happen. I've already written it, but now I've got to go back and fill in all that other stuff. And yeah. so yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people get bogged down on too many ideas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if they're still there after a while, then it's probably worth pursuing. Yeah, I have this idea that it's a new writer, more experienced writer problem. Like when I was a new writer, I wrote down everything I imagined. Like every every time I would wake up or I went to the grocery store and had a good idea, I write it down like they were ephemeral, like they disappear. Yeah. And that specific thing, well, it is. It does disappear. However, like that, I didn't know Stephen King said that, but that's brilliant. The ones that really mean something, they do stick around. So as I got more experience yeah. and I started to write more, I stopped doing that. And sometimes, you know, you ask me how long do they gestate. Mm -hmm. There's an idea I've had for at least – and I, I don't know, but probably 30 years, um, that is in the trash man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was sitting there, and I kept trying to write a story. I knew what the story was titled. It was called The Man Who Invented Time, uh, The Man Who Repairs Time. Interesting. And so, and I knew who this guy was and what he did. I didn't know mm -hmm. how time got damaged. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and if you've seen the cover for The Trash Man, you kind of get a hint. There's this giant rhinoceros charging out of the sky. Oh, an orange one. Don't orange. leave out the details. Orange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Kennedy, my publisher, said when he was asking about the cover, he goes, you know, that's the first time I've ever asked an artist to draw a, uh, an orange rhinoceros. <laughs> did you say you're welcome? Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I told him, I said, now, see, Chris, that's one more thing you can mark off your list. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ideas can, they're there for as long as they're there. And, mm -hmm. um, this, this, that particular book got a whole bunch of stuff that was, I, I just couldn't figure out how to fit what was a really good idea, but it wouldn't fit anywhere else. And it was all just kind of laying there going, me, 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 throw me in here. And, and it all just worked. That's so cool. It That's was a lot of fun. One. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to tell you at Superstars last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I won one of your books, The Killing Hitler's Reich. Oh yeah. And so I got it signed for my son. Yeah, so, I remember that. He's like obsessed with World War II. He loves it. So yeah. I was wondering what stoked your interest in this particular era of World War II. Okay. Uh World War II, obviously, this is completely different than fiction, uh, because this is a nonfiction book. And that it's book, a book. Yeah, it's a book. It's not 300, a family. 000, 300, 000 words, 13 years, 800 resources, about 200 of about 200 of them were in German that I holy, had to translate. Wow. Um, so anyway, one of my earliest memories in my life, and I was about eight years old, is reading a 
and I even know the book. I was in my mom's car. It was 1963, thereabouts. And the book was called Samuel Elliott Morrison's The Two Ocean War. And it was about the U.S. Navy in World War II. I have no idea why. I, I, I long ago quit wondering why I was so interested in the Second World War. And American involvement, when you look at other countries, our involvement really wasn't that long. I mean, compared to the Germans and the British had been fighting for two, almost two and a half years before we got involved. Mm -hmm. And so one of the areas that is least understood by Americans is the German-Russian War. And that's where that book came from is I was in, I was in Vienna. And I'd been I've been writing uh, nonfiction for a long time, history, military history. And uh, well, I can see I, that in your book. So that's not a big surprise, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I had been concentrating more and more on the Eastern Front, the Russian German War. Gotcha. And so uh, we were I was in Vienna with uh, some friends. We were on a tour with a bunch of students. And I wanted to read about a history about what happened in Austria during the war. Mm -hmm. And come to find out that there weren't any. Now, think about World War II. You know, we've got, um, I found Hitler's underwear. And, uh, you know, just every imaginable arcane thing you can imagine. But we didn't have a book about what happened in Austria at the end of the war. <laughs> which actually involved more fighting than anywhere else. Interesting. So, I think everyone was thinking about Berlin at that time. So they, they were. were really... and, and still are. Still are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, my friend said, well, if there's not a book, you need to write it. Mm -hmm. And I both, you know, I, I cursed her for a long time till I finished it. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it, it, I'll never, ever recoup the money that I spent, the time and the resources I bought and all that in writing that book. But it is the definitive book on that part of the Eastern Front, I mean, there is nothing else in English about it. And if there ever is, it's they're going to have to rely on my book and build on mine mm -hmm. to do something else. I mean, it's... I was going to say, yours will be, it'll be referenced for a long time. It will. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of that. You know, it's, it's a contribution to a, a large uh, genre that, you know, facts don't really change. You can argue about them, but the facts themselves don't particularly change. So I'm, I'm extremely proud of it. I hope your son enjoyed it. Yes, he hasn't finished it. That's how big it is. He is a yeah. teenager. So, yeah, well, it's a but <laughs> he's still working on it. Okay. But <laughs> so I, I that, actually remember signing it for him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Um, well, I'm wondering because you had a lot of authors on there. Who has inspired you the most, do you think? Who had the most influence on your writing? I would say on my later writing, meaning not when I was 20 and trying to copy everybody. We, we all go through that stage. That's exactly. part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. I would have to say it's Roger Zelazny. Okay. Um, mainly because it's not so much what he wrote, mm -hmm. although there's a lot of Nine Princes and Amber in The Trash Man. If you've never read the Amber series, calling it science fiction is really not accurate it that's where it's usually lumped it's more a grandfather of of some sort of fantasy i mean it's really even hard to describe 50 years after it was written and uh, and if you haven't read it it's 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 pretty amazing series but yeah, i don't uh, know if i've read any rogers lansky i might have to or zelansky I, i'm gonna have to add that to my list i think uh well zelazny was considered it during his time and he died very young he, he was 58 when he died mm. uh, he was considered one of the masters <laughs> and wrote a lot uh i forget how many hugos and nebulas he won but it was a lot wow. um lord of lights considered a classic um one Actually, of my favorite one. uh one of my favorite stories the uh last defender of camelot uh, <laughs> about merlin waking up in modern times and uh, the doors of his face, the lamps of his mouth. I mean, the, the list is endless. Hmm. If you really want to read something fun for your introduction to him, mm -hmm. not very long. It'll, it's a quick read. Read a book called A Night in the Lonesome October. A and Night in the Lonesome October. It's written from the standpoint of Jack the Ripper's dog. Dog? Yes. Interesting. And Jack the Ripper's one of the good guys. What? Now I'm fascinated. 
Um, it, it's it's really it's it's so good, and huh. it was one of the last books he ever wrote before he died, and it was just, it's just so entertaining and so imaginative, and so he had a great influence on me in style mm-hmm. and how I construct sentences and describe things. Um, he was a very fast writer. He didn't use a lot of description, uh, and, and I don't either. He his famous. So he was uh, ahead of his time, huh? He 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 very much was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a stylist, because he was writing in the '60s and '70s mm-hmm. when um, uh, things were a little bit. I, I'm not, I don't want to say heavy or handed, but it was just a. Different but I think time. you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so Zelazny probably had more influence on me now. You know, Howard Early, mm-hmm. uh, Fritz Leiber, if you haven't read any of his, he was a contemporary of Howard's. He came along right after Howard died, kind of in the same genre. He was he wrote Sword and Sorcery also. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was just com- very literate about it. His guys were had a funnier... And Howard was Conan, right? Con- Howard was Conan. Okay, that's what Conan, I Conan, Cole, uh, Solomon Kane. If it wasn't for Robert E. Howard... Uh, and if anybody wants to argue it, don't because you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> there would not be a sword and sorcery. He is more or less the father of that subgenre. Uh, if it wasn't for Conan, I don't think sword and sorcery would have ever become what it is today. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, yeah, you know, it, but when you say influences, God, after you've read so many books, mm-hmm. Kelly, it's just know, blend. Like, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Uh, I can look at um, the book, The Trash Man, which is the latest book. That's why I keep referring to it and the one we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and I just look at all the influences and stuff, and, and I can I can actively say that I know that Nine Princes and Amber had a lot to do with the construction of the narrative, the, not, not at all the um, scenes or any of that stuff. It's not like mm-hmm. copying, but things that occurred, where they occurred in the book, that kind of thing, the actual mechanics of it. Um, but there's a little bit of the Avengers in there, the movie. Uh, love that movie. Huh? I love oh, yeah. that movie. Well, I love the first one, yeah. The, other, the second was good, too. Uh, the last two were, they were good. I was starting to get a little, hmm. but anyway. Um, they served their purpose. They did. They served their purpose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the first one was just absolutely brilliant. Yep, totally agree. All right, so let's see. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? You know, I actually gave this question a lot of thought. Ooh, I'm glad I asked it. Yeah, and you would probably approve. It would be U.S. Virgin Islands mm-hmm. or the British Virgin Islands. I'm not that <laughs> Um They're very close. Yes, yes. Maybe Key West. Maybe uh the Cayman Islands, you know, you're probably getting a, a, a theme here. Belize, we talked about earlier. Blue Someplace. water, warm weather, fruity uh, drinks. Well, I'm all for that. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only the only problem with it is I would probably never get anything done. That's right. It's too relaxing, right? They I, call it island time for a reason, right? Give me a stack of books for my Kindle and... Uh, a chair on the beach, and I really don't care what else is going on. You're good. No more I'm motivation. Good for, I'm good forever. <laughs> no feed me occasionally. That's right. Uh, and and I, I'd be fine. Uh, yeah. No, that's a great answer. No writing writing commune. I'm good with that one. Yeah, I think maybe we if we're all there, we'll we'll needle each other until we write something. I think Kevin Kevin J mm-hmm. needs to establish a writers commune someplace like that. I think they should. I think I think Rebecca needs to come down to be at a lower elevation. So we could totally work this out. Let's 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 talk to him. All right, all right. We're we're gonna we're gonna convince him this is the way to go. Okay. Okay. Next question. So your newest novel, The Trash Man, the one we've been talking about, it's labeled as a hit world book. So can yes. you tell us a bit about this hit world? Yes. Mm-hmm. Hit world is a place where uh well it's really I would rather use a movie to describe it, okay? Mm-hmm. Think John Wick. Okay. Only he's got a license to kill. Everything Wait, John, he does is, John Wick doesn't have a license to kill? Not not from the government. Oh, good point. Okay, I get you. So you mean an actual license to kill? I mean an actual, the government says, here, you're allowed to go kill people. But it all has to be done according to regulations. And, of course, they get okay. a, a hefty chunk. 
mm. off the top. Taxes right there, man. They'll get you. Exactly. Taxes, mm -hmm. fees, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have an organization called Life Enders Incorporated. Okay. And Life Enders handles all the contracts. They feed them down to their various shooters, their licensed people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are the ones who carry out the uh, killings. The idea was to control murder and that, that it would cut down on it and all that if you uh, you know, if you kill somebody and then somebody says, well, I bet he's the one that did it. I'm going to hire somebody to kill him. Well, after a while, you're kind of going, well, we're either going to run out of people to kill, you know, in this little circle or we're out of money. Of it. Yeah. You know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I don't want to take out a hit on this guy because he's going to take out a hit on me because there's insurance policies. Uh huh. You know, if somebody hits me, I want you to hit this guy because I think he's the one that's going to do it. Gotcha. What's that? The mutual shared destruction kind of thing? Yeah, mutual assured destruction. Yeah, that's um, it. And so it, it, it's got all these little dynamics through it and all this kind of stuff. And the main character is a guy who, uh, this all occurred because 9-11 uh, mm -hmm. was actually much worse than it really was historically. Wiped out our entire government down to a very junior senator. Mm. And that senator did not have the political capital or the will to risk starting a third world war by going over to hunt these guys down in other countries. So all these billionaires got together and said, well, if you're not going to do it, we will. And they financed a mercenary group called the life enders, gave them all the money they came needed. From. And they said, nah, these aren't American. This is not an American thing. These are, <laughs> you know, and they went over and they took care of the whole thing. <laughs> and when they Problem were done, solved. they came back and the American people had gotten disgusted and held a special election in the meantime. Well, I hope so. There's no well, government left. And uh, they elected, uh, on a write-in vote, they elected Charlton Heston. <laughs> so, yeah, 20 years ago, I would believe that. <laughs> so here, we now have uh, a government that says, uh, you know, and they go along with the whole murder thing to try and get the crime rate under control, and, and it just becomes a thing, and and it becomes obvious it's really not working the way they thought. But then again, the revenue is so huge mm -hmm. that they're kind of going, yeah, but, you know, we're making a lot of money here. So <laughs> let's just keep it. That's the setup. And uh, uh, the book starts off. Um, are, are you a fan of old uh, noirish detective movies and books and things? I Dashiell am. Hammett, and Green new Stanford. ones like Dresden Files. Yes. OK, Dresden Files. Mm -hmm. Any of the noirish stuff, that that genre. That, mm -hmm. that style. Um, and Except Dresden for the way Files, they treated women. Otherwise, yes. Well, and some old. of that comes it's into okay. this in the beginning, <laughs> only uh, with the uh, attitude of the main guy, my, mm -hmm. my character. He simply learns better. Mm. Okay, so he, the, the first line of the book is, uh, it, it's straight out of Raymond Chandler, 1945. Um, if I can remember it, the, uh, the blonde was bleached like raptor bones, Frozen in Cretaceous mud. That's and bleached. That's really bleached. That's really bleached. Even though, <laughs> which doesn't make much sense because they're usually brown. But you know, I, that's ah, who cares? It's logic. Colorful language, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so he 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 takes on a hit, and um, he, of course, like so many men, it's the wrong woman, and he underestimates her, and things do not work out the way he's planning. And all of a sudden, he finds himself the target. And then he learns that everything that he thought was real was all false. And the whole world was completely different than he thought it was. Interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And uh, for anybody who's read any of my other stuff, mm -hmm. my other fiction, mm -hmm. it, it will read like one of my books in that um, I have a particular style like everybody and it's very fast. There's a lot of action, uh, but it, but I also think it's one of the more imaginative books that I know I'll ever write. And probably one of the more imaginative you're likely to read for a while. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm really cool. proud of it. Yeah. I can't wait. I read the beginning, but I tried to do research. So I tried to get through, you know, as many as I can. Yeah, so I, no, I, get it. Yeah, I, I couldn't do. finish it. Yeah. Um, but I will. So here, here's our here's our question, the one that I've asked of every single person, and right. that is, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And I was prepared for this one too. Yes. Cherry. 
cherry. Nice. We haven't had a fruit heavy one yet. Good yeah. choice. And if you get to kind of mix it with something, mm-hmm. a really good vanilla. Mm. So that cherry vanilla, they mm-hmm. just go together so well with a cup of coffee. I mean, it's breakfast or, of uh, champions. Uh, well, yeah, or midnight <laughs> snack of champions. That's right. I don't Wait, care. You drink coffee late too? So do I. No, if I drink coffee after about, uh, if I drink caffeine after about five, I'll be away. Oh my gosh! Yeah. But that's okay. You know, if I'm eating th- that ice cream, then uh, lack of sleep's probably going to be my, the least of my problems. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, coffee does not wake me up. I really wish it would. Let's see. So what project that's in progress or not started are you most excited about? You know, I always hate to questions like that because it's like I'm denying some of my kids. It's like, which kid do you like best? Yeah, but see, Uh, the kids have feelings. Your books will forgive you. uh, I have to say, I was I, when I was going through one of your one of the beginnings of your books. You were like brave enough to put when the next books were coming out, like you know, twenty twenty oh. and twenty and twenty twenty one. And I was like, wow, good for you. You're like, I've got this. So you must think that. about this. Yeah, it doesn't always work out that way. But yeah, I do. <laughs> I have, I have at least the titles, the plans are in place uh-huh. uh, through twenty twenty three. Nice. So nice. we'll see. Um, I'll tell you about it. It's not so much a particular book because I'm, I'm always, I'm like everybody. The book I'm writing now is really interesting. I'm co-writing a book with a young lady named Kayla Krantz. Okay. Kayla is a uh, young author. She's got a bunch of books out. She sold a lot of books. Um, she writes in the horror field a lot. Love horror. Well, you know, you really ought to look her up. She'd be a great guest for you. I would. Um, and, uh, She's uh, completely indie. Okay. I've known her for, and I say known, you know, I'm, I'm 65. She's 25. So, but we've known each other on online for at least four years. And uh, I reached out to her and I said, Kayla, you know, would you be interested? Do you have a, a series or anything in mind that you've thought about writing and haven't done it? And she said, yes. And she sh- told me about the series and uh, it's, it's about a world in which, a virus wipes out most women. Men are more or less immune, but <laughs> and uh, uh, what happens to the women afterwards? Well, of course, everybody need, wants to exploit them because there's not very many of them left. Mm-hmm. And so uh, she has already written the book. She did the primary writing, and I'm I'm going back and revising and you know co-writing some stuff like that and everything. So uh, I'm I'm very excited about that. And That's then as a, as what's a, it going to be called? Um, the Working title is Bleeders. Okay. And that's not referring to the women. That's actually referring to a gang Mm -hmm. of bad guys in the book. Um, And then, as as a if I can kind of cheat here, the project, you know, Hit World has got, um, I think, eight books in production in some various stages. Nice. And what happened there was so many people said. Larry and I were, were sharing it with some friends and everybody said, Oh, can I write in this universe and all that? Mm-hmm. And there's an anthology coming that we didn't even ask for because people just started sending us finished stories. That's awesome. Of course you, you've been writing this story. You know, you should have told us. <laughs> so, um, we're kind of now waiting to see who else might be interested. And, uh, you know, Chris, Chris is handling all that now as the publisher. Uh-huh. But I'm like uh, especially didn't this book just come out like two weeks ago? Uh January fifteenth. Yeah, so it's been real recent. That's impressive. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's brand new. Mm-hmm. The next one's coming out February twenty sixth. Excellent. That was uh, written by Larry and I. It's it mm-hmm. Larry did the main writing and then uh, I went back and uh co- and you know, did my thing. Nice. Yeah, Larry's coming on at the end of March, so we'll get to talk to oh, him. Oh good. Oh mm-hmm. good, good, good. Mm-hmm. All right, excellent. Um I'll have something else to do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have to give Larry some grief, you know, since I know he's listening. He is listening. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he'll write something back to me. But, um, and then the third book will come out probably in early April, somewhere around that, written by a guy named John Sears. And there's others already there. So Hit World is just a really big deal. And, and I'm very excited about it. But I'm also excited about, uh, as you know, my, my first series was called The Last Brigade. Mm-hmm. And it's... Turned out to be more popular than I ever dreamed. 
Mm. Um, well, that beginning is a killer. You had me crying. On the beginning of the book? Yes. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's so funny because I thought it was too graphic uh, before. And then a female friend of mine online who I met said, you need to make this gorier. And I said, really? I thought it was pretty, pretty bad. She goes, no, 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 no. We really need to hurt. This needs to hurt. Well, it worked. I hurt. Good. Well, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks. No, that's true. That is what we want, though. So that's it why is, we read. We want to feel. And, uh -huh. and so um, that series has proved to be extremely popular. And mm -hmm. there are at least six books coming out in that this year, not just by me. Uh, John Babb, a very good friend of mine, who, if he's not listening now, John, you're, you know, I don't know if your book's going to come out now or not. But uh, uh, John has written uh, three in the series. I'm writing two, and then we're gonna we've got an anthology that's more or less filled up. Mm -hmm. So, as as you know on my Facebook feed, I'm I'm usually involved in a lot of different things at once. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I understand, me too. Yeah, you got to yeah. keep it going. Well, you do, and and I have 26 books on the uh, schedule for this year that I'm either writing or editing in some former fashion and if i don't get them all done then i don't but i am the book i'm actually reading now is kevin j anderson's book on being a dictator mm, yes that was and, a quick read i read that at girl scout camp you could do that yeah, yeah. and here's here's my my recorder so <laughs> um yeah but I'm, I'm really trying to absorb it yeah no i can understand that i can understand that i just i i have trouble now, I'm, I know it's another skill you have to learn, but I'm, I, you know, I'm running a publishing company, so there are so many skills I'm already trying to learn. I just don't have time for that one right now. That's all. And I, and I want to tell you that I really admire you for doing that, because one of the reasons that Hit World is with Kevin, I mean, with uh, Chris Kennedy Publishing, mm -hmm. is that Larry and I were going to just, these started out as short stories. Mm -hmm. um, the Trash Man started out as a story called Kill Me When You Can, mm -hmm. and um a bullet for the shooter, which is book two, started out as shoot first. And um, Larry and I were just going to do these with our friends, and we were going to put them out ourselves, self-publish them, and mm -hmm. sell them at cons and stuff, and just you know, fun. Right. Something we can all do, maybe make a buck or two, but probably just for fun. Mm -hmm. And early this year, I decided I, I had been planning on doing a lot of this myself, and I go, uh, and I just thought I don't want to be a publisher. I, I'm, I'm. At the age now where I'd rather just write the books and let somebody else do it. Yep. And and sure, you know, I'm not making the same money that a completely indie is. But then again, I'm not having to do all the work on the back end either. Exactly. It's a trade-off. It exactly is. exactly right. Mm -hmm. And for me, the trade-off was to partner with some really good publishers mm -hmm. and let them do what they do and let me write the books. Mm -hmm. And so I have a... I have a tremendous respect for what you do as a publisher oh, I really you. do. yeah actually i had a question about your publisher because i saw it was um dingbat publisher for, dingbat. for the, the book and it says they're in humble texas so yes. i mean i'm right here in houston i would never even heard of them so where did you find them okay so the way i got published it's really fun uh mm -hmm. uh dingbat is run by a lady who's an, a writer mm -hmm. and she's been a very successful writer uh named jay gunner gray and gray is with an e Mm -hmm. So right away, I liked her. Right. <laughs> um, and I I found her through a Twitter contest. Really? Interesting. Uh, at one time, I'm not sure it still is, but at one time, I considered Twitter the literary vortex of the internet. There are a lot of writers on there. Well, there's not just a lot of writers. There were a lot of writers contests where mm -hmm. mine was called Pitch to Publisher, and it still exists. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, they have Pitch I Mad. I as a publisher, okay. I participate in Pitch Mad too. So you know what Pitch Madness is. Mm -hmm. So you know about all these. Pitch to Pub was like mm -hmm. that in a way. And when I was on uh, Pitch to Pub, it was February 3rd, 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got on there and we got six tweets in uh, 12 hours. Nice. Back when it was 140 characters. Right. By the time you had all your hashtags, I think I had 121. <laughs> So I put them up. Uh, they said 43 small publishers were looking. They were all small presses, but that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I got four people who asked for full manuscripts. One was Clean Reads, and they wanted to know if I could eliminate all the 
sex, violence, and bad language. You're like, uh, no. Yeah, you know, th- have you ever met a Marine? <laughs> they don't generally walk around going, gosh, those people are shooting at us. <laughs> but it was very nice of them to ask. I mean, I, I make fun, but, you know, it was very nice of them. A friend uh-huh. of mine publishes a lot with them. Uh, another one, and, and just today on my Patreon channel, I posted the query letter I sent them, was mm-hmm. another publisher who offered me a contract within two days. Wow. Did they even read the it? Contract. And, and I hired a lawyer to look it over, and the lawyer said, run. Uh-oh. <laughs> they didn't read it. <laughs> so I, I didn't sign with them, even though I got along with the guy, and four months later, they were out of business. Mm, not surprised. About three weeks later, I got a letter from, I mean, an email from this Gunner Gray person, and she said, mm-hmm. uh, look, I love this, but I, it's really too good for me. You need to send this to Bain. Mm. She said, this is at least as good as what they're putting out. I like so, her already. Uh, sure, yeah, okay. You know, you uh-huh. want to, uh, you know, if you know Tony, if you've got Tony Weisskopf's number, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so, Just call Jody, uh, she'll hook you up. <laughs> you're right, sure. Hey, Jody. <laughs> You know, don't I have a restraining order against you? Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, and I did. I sent it to Bain. It was their slush pile. But oh, yeah. about a week later, I thought, you know, anybody who's that honest, mm-hmm. I, I really need to investigate. So I talked to her, and uh, we agreed that if they decided to buy the book, that she would just say, good luck to you. You know, that's great. And if not, we'd go ahead with it. And about a week before it was published in August, uh, Bain sent me a form rejection from the slush pile. And, um, and you're like, I made the right decision. I, I, I was. Mm-hmm. And the book came out, and I was thinking, I mean, I'm like every new author, Kelly, who, you know, I, who doesn't even know what they're doing. Right. I was still mired in 1990 because I've been doing this so long. Mm-hmm. And uh, I printed out a copy of the first manuscript, the first draft. So that I would know how much it weighed for when I sent it to publishers, mm-hmm. knowing that if they got something like that, they would just dump it because they don't want paper. They want right. You know, they, they want uh, digital. Uh-huh. So anyway, um, and uh, I was expecting to sell a couple of copies, and we sold thousands of copies for the end of the year. That's In awesome. four months, I qualified for CIFWA. Wow! Uh, and uh, we had the ne- the new. The second book was already written, so it came out in February, and we sold thousands in pre-order. And so I kind of thought, okay, well, you know, mm-hmm. I wonder how this happened. That's awesome. I, I think it was just, um, it was a time period where uh, it, it's military science fiction, but there's very little science fiction in it. Mm-hmm. If you'll buy cryogenics, mm-hmm. then you're going to buy the rest of the premise because the rest of the premises the premise for that series is simply that as people leave the military in today's time mm-hmm. and have no family or kids or anything we ask them to go into cryogenic sleep against the day we might need them again so you know kevin eikenberry mm-hmm. if you didn't have kids you know we can't you're still a young man we can't train you to do what you've been doing for the last 20 or 25 years mm-hmm so would you might you know go to sleep until we need you and then we're going to call you back and let you do what you do. And so they they have thousands of people who agree and then for one reason or another mm-hmm. the call never comes. They wake up and there is no America. It's 50 years later. America's gone and they have to try and resurrect the whole thing. Wow. So that's how that all happened. It was all just um I sat down to write a book in on September 1st, 2014 using those two scenes that I mentioned earlier. That mm-hmm. was disconnected. Mm-hmm. And I sat down to write those and did and just never stopped writing until the first two books were finished. For some That's reason. So fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, to this day, I couldn't tell you why after a 20 year hiatus, I started writing fiction again. Hmm. That's pretty cool. It just spoke to you. It, it obviously it did or somebody mm-hmm. did. I'm kind of afraid to find out. <laughs> Sometimes don't ask. Yeah, don't ask. Yeah, my daughter, uh, on Tuesday nights, we have the kids, they're teenagers. So we have, they take turns making dinner because I'm mm-hmm. like, you know, my husband and I were busy. So today she was just making baked potatoes in the microwave. Yeah. 
And so she came in and she was like, yeah, you know, she says they're in there doing their satanic ritual. I'm like, what? She goes, you know, they're in a circle. I'm like, oh, okay. And she said, yeah, I was going to draw the little, you know, the little star on the inside, but I was like, ah, oh, it's too much work. And I said, <laughs> I said, okay, now what did that been funny? You know, we're like, okay, um, um, we'd love to do the talk tonight, but we can't because my daughter somehow summoned a demon while she was making potatoes. I'm not. I, it's a See, long that's story. A story. Yeah. That's a story. <laughs> right? That is and a story. And the demon can't get out of the microwave. <laughs> that's right. I'm, but I'm, we're I'm hungry. Eat, <laughs> yes. You know, it eats all the potatoes in it. It's like, what are we yeah. going to do now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was just, it was hilarious. So, you know, like the earlier question, where do ideas come from, right? That's the... And, and that's. You know, that's a great point, Kelly, but that's exactly where ideas come from. Yep. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> only my kids, um, only my kids. So do your kids like to draw by any chance? No. Uh, my daughter rides horses, and she loves to take pictures. Um, oh. And my son loves to read, and he works on cars. Okay. If you need three more horses, I've got three that would be a great match for you. Don't say that. She wants horses really badly. Okay, well. we'll we own take- one already. We'll pay to get them down there. You can't <laughs> ride them. One of them, one's too mean and one's too broken down and one's a little mini. But uh, you know, oh no, mini. Have them. No, nope, we don't want anything under sixteen hands. <laughs> okay. She's a hunter jumper, right? So she does all the big stuff. Yeah, my wife actually did that until about ten years ago. Really, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, and, that's and she just world. she got thrown too many times, and mm-hmm. I told her I said, you know, I'm I'm tired of coming to the emergency room. <laughs> See, my daughter's seventeen. She still bounces back. <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. And her reflexes are probably a little better. Exactly. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun. But she really wants another, because uh, sh- we have an OTTB, but he's yeah. 20 years old. Yeah. So he's, Pat, like, he can't jump over three foot anymore. He, right. You know what I mean? He's great for lessons. He's great for smaller stuff, but he's not. Trail he ride or he to do that. Or, yeah. yeah, something fun. Um, but so she wants a younger one so she could do the higher jumps and stuff. I'm sure. like, <laughs> they're not free, though. And I don't mean the horses. I mean keeping them alive. Yeah, the, the horses themselves, that's not the expense. No, that's the easy part. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the grass they eat every day that costs a fortune. That's, or when you live in the suburbs, the barn, you have to keep them at. So, yeah. Well, that's us. Mm-hmm. Ours aren't here. Ours are down in Mississippi at a barn. And so, yeah, I, I yeah. get it. Yep. Yeah, but, it hey. is not a subject we discuss. You know, it's not like we discuss it every day. <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, no, I get it, though, man. They're hard to let go once you got them. They are. Yep. So, well, speaking of this kind of thing, where is your favorite place to write? Right here. Seriously. Right here? Uh, right here in my office. Uh, I have a uh, I have a wireless keyboard. Mm-hmm. Dirty, but arg- wireless, ergonomic. Mm-hmm. And I lean back, and I just do this. Um. <laughs> Now, I hope it's going to be in the car with my recorder. Right, as you're learning the new skill. Uh-huh. As I'm learning mm-hmm. the new skill because uh, to go into cons and things like that. And it's funny, too, that I really enjoy writing at a con. But, of course, that's not something we've been able to do for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's, I've, I've only started doing it in the last year before it all shut down. But it's really fun to bring your laptop, especially if you're in the dealer room or uh, waiting on a panel or something, and just or even in the in the Starbucks because you know there's always a Starbucks. Yes. Um, and sit there and write. And um, I actually got a story done uh, because of that, where I was at uh, ShadowCon in January of last year, and this is part of how I wound up with Chris Kennedy. Uh, do you know Rob Howell by any chance? I do not. Rob is the new fiction. I guess he's the fantasy acquisitions editor or head of fantasy, whatever, for Chris. Okay. For Chris Kennedy. Okay, gotcha. And, and so um, Rob was at ShadowCon with me last year, and we both had um, tables. And I was writing, and he walked over, and he said, uh, hey, would you like to write a, sh- a story You know, in this? We've got a, a fantasy anthology. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like. It's based on Conan. It can't be Conan, but that whole right. t- style and ethos and all that. Mm-hmm. I said, sure, yeah, I'd love to do it. And he goes, okay, great, man. You know, 7 to 10K. Um, it's doing a week. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll do that now. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. You know, 
And uh, before the end of the day, I had about 800 words, which surprised me because I didn't have a clue. Well, that's how the idea starts to come, right? No, that makes sense. I have a series. I have a series in that. So I wrote a a, a story in that series. Oh, cool. So you didn't have to create the world. Pardon me? No, I didn't have have to create my own world. I had my own world. I had to make it relatable and and enough known Mm -hmm. that about it. And I just had a Cthulhu story come out in another anthology. So I kind of put, okay, how can I work this in? And I worked a Cthulhu-like god into the story in my universe. And it's kind of like Cthulhu's variation in, you know, mine as opposed to H.P. Lovecraft's universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, and so I have to say that was really a lot of fun because I did a lot of writing there at the con on that particular story. Mm-hmm. And I probably will do a lot more of that as cons pick back up. But that was the last con I went to. Interesting. Yes, we just, Cursed Dragon Ship just signed up for four cons in the Houston area, just hoping. You know, like, please, Would please you do me let a it big happen. Favor? Would I'm you sorry? Send me those cons? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Kayla, Kayla, the young lady I was telling you about earlier, lived, mm-hmm. I think she's moved back to Michigan now, but I think she lived down there close to Houston. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I would really like to know about some of those cons. So, yeah, that'd be great. Now, of course, it's, Will it happen? Right. That's why I said we were, we're, we're just, we're being hopeful. So we're like, we're signing up now. We're going to be hopeful and just, we're going to play it by ear. What else can we do? Yeah. We huh. have the, the chat is sad. Steven and Helen and they're like, yes, we miss our, we miss our cons. Oh man, me too. And you know, I, cons are embarrassing for me because I usually, uh, even, especially if I'm on a panel with somebody mm-hmm. like David Weber or David Gerald or somebody, some legend. Uh, and I just go fanboy on them, and it's embarrassing. But it's like, <laughs> I've been a fanboy a lot longer than I've been, you know, on this behind yeah. this table. Yeah, I've been on a panel with Tracy Hickman, and I almost died. Uh, I mean, what are you going to do? I, and, I asked him to sign books. I brought them. I was not shy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got this whole big stack right next. I to did you. this big one. Hi, yeah. I'm beside you. But now that we're done, can you sign all these? Thanks, man. <laughs> I, I was on a panel with uh, Tim Zahn, and it was just he and I. Uh-huh. And they had forgotten to set up a table. Oh, no. So we're in a ballroom with no microphones or anything else. Uh-huh. So he says, well, let's just pull up a couple of chairs. So we pulled up two chairs and just sat there right with the audience. Uh-huh. And somebody asked a question, and he turned to me, and I, and I looked at him and I said, they're not here to see me. They don't care. <laughs> They want to hear you. <laughs> You're Tim Zahn. I'm not. So, you know, take uh, so, yeah, I miss them a lot. And I'm hoping Fantasy is the first one that I'm hoping for. That's in March 19th. Nice. And as of now, it's a go, but we'll March see. March is a little early. I know. Cross our fingers. Cross Crossing our fingers. fingers, yes. And they oh. say unless the governor shuts them down or the hotel, they're going to do it. So we can hope. Let's hope. And that the people still come. Yeah, we signed up for Dragon Con again. You know what I mean? We're like, come on, man, Dragon Con. Well, I'll see you there. I just got my room. Yes. Yeah, we have a legacy room. So it's, it yeah, is. Yeah, I know. And, yeah. and, I, and I do not hate you for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'm sensing sarcasm. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm close. I'm in the first overflow. So I'm, I'm just down the street. And it's. Well, you know, hint, hint, after the recording, we might be able to hook you up. Talk to us. All oh. right. So let's see what I have more questions. Oh, remember uh, also audience, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, let's see. I asked you that one. We're asking about our order, which is good. That means it's naturally flowing. Isn't that nice? It is. Oh, here. I have something totally off topic because it's more fun. What sure. is the best thing you have ever, or at least lately eaten? Okay. So are you, by any chance, are you going to 20 books to 50 K in November? I thought about it. And I haven't decided because okay. it's so hard to get in anyways. Okay. So if you, if you do, you'll find out what I'm talking okay. about. Okay. Gotcha. This has been a few years, mm-hmm. but it's remarkable. There's a little hotel, little restaurant right there in the front of the Flamingo. Okay. Right on the strip mm-hmm. that has a pasta dish that I ordered six nights in a row. What? It's completely homemade, including the pasta. Uh, and it was a pasta. It was like a pasta primavera, but it had um, 
it had meat in it too. I think it had either ham or chicken, or maybe you could get it with one or either one. Hmm. And it was to die for. And, and you know, for me, it's it's all about pasta, I mean, all about any kind of starches and pastas and that's awesome. Anything like that. So uh, it it was just remarkably good. But I live in a place where we are known for. Have you ever been to Memphis by any chance? I've been through Memphis. Right. It's still on our bucket list. If if you if you even drive through, let me know and I'll take you to lunch at one of these places. Or There's some more time in Knoxville. I want to say it was Knoxville. My mom. Came yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent two two of the longest two years out of the longest decade. Uh, I mean, in <laughs> Knoxville, I went to school there. Oh, and, did you? Uh, I did. Two, Interesting. For, for two years, and then my family, my my dad said, you know, you can flunk out of college just as easily at Memphis. And for a lot less money. <laughs> You're like, oh, that sounds and I, good. And I thought, yeah, sure, whatever. So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> Memphis is known. Memphis, is, you're known for barbecue. I know Texas is, but mostly it's beef. We're, yes, we're, Texas we're known is mostly for pork. beef. And in Memphis, the Memphis specialty is dr- what we call dry ribs. Mm. And it's ribs that don't have sauce. Mm-hmm. They have the dry rub that's all mm-hmm. on there, and it's cooked right in there. Very juicy. It's not like they're dry ribs, but right, they right. have a sauce. And yep. if you get some really good ones, and all the really good ones uh, are run by these folks who came out of the Delta 100 years ago. Their families did. And they're mm-hmm. cooking them in these little – a lot of these are gone now, but this was when I was growing up. There were these little roadside shacks. Well, now they're all in food trucks. Well – yeah, uh, that's true. I'm not sure these folks are running them, but uh, <laughs> and they'd be cooking over a, a garbage can, you know, a steel garbage can, and mm-hmm. they'd be smoking their stuff and they'd cut them all these homemade smokers and stuff. And mm-hmm. there's still one not too far from where I live, run by the same people that have been running it for years. They don't even have a menu. You just drive in and whatever they've got, whatever they cook that day, mm-hmm. they'll shovel it up for you and tell you. And it, the price varies to, if they like you. <laughs> So be and nice to the people serving you your meat. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. it is so good. Oh, that's incredible. You know, that's a secret. People don't, most Texas barbecue, uh, well, not most, Texas barbecue, you don't put sauce on it. See? And that's so the So they're all about the dry rubs, too. As my dad brought me up, he said, you know, if God had wanted sauce on barbecue, he would have had a pig, in his case, born with a bottle of sauce in its mouth. <laughs> Hey, I like sauce, man. I but. like it too. I, I do too. Mm-hmm. And and if you like sauce, there's a place here in town that's got one that's just unique and mm-hmm. killer. They're they're well known for it. So that's awesome. Someday cons as we travel with the publishing company, we'll be all over. Mid South so when we stop in Memphis, you can show us around, Bill. Mid South Con. If I'm there, that same weekend as Fantasy, but yeah. Ah, gotcha. Well, not this year, anyways, right? So we'll see. Not this year. Um, let's see. I have, uh, the last brigade, uh, brigade has some hardcore soldiers in its main cast. Yes. And so I had a question before, cause I didn't know you were, that you're a Marine. So you're a Marine? No, no, I'm, I'm not. I did not serve. Okay. Cause that was my question was how did you do research for these characters? So a lot of them are actually my relatives. Oh, interesting. Family I, dinners. Pardon me? Family dinners. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> well, most of those ended with plates being thrown, but um, I'm getting the Jerry Springer reference. Hold on, let me put this together. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, two of two of them are my uh, uncles who did not have any kids, mm. and both served in the army, uh, retired from the army, and they're both buried at Arlington. And so that's my way wow. of remembering them. Mm-hmm. And keeping them alive since they didn't have any kids. Yeah. One of them uh, is a cousin who didn't make it out of Vietnam. Hmm. And he would probably shoot me for making him a Marine. He was actually in the Army. Oh, yeah. There'd be temper tantrums. Oh, yeah. He would not mm-hmm. not be pleased. But, uh, you know, sorry. Sorry, Marty. <laughs> uh, you know, I meant well. Uh, and, and a lot of them are... Um, the main character in the series is a man named Nick Angriff. And Angriff is the German word for attack. 
which I thought was really a cool thing. And I did that before I ever thought, I, back when I thought there's nobody going to read this book. <laughs> so I'm just going to have fun. And, and now, you know, it's probably, I don't know how many copies it sold. It's probably north of 50,000. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of going, well, and, and I actually had to write a story explaining how he got that name because not very many Germans named attack. Um, but there actually is a parallel. A common German name is Krieger. Mm -hmm. And Krieg is the German word for war. Krieger means warrior. warrior. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a story about how his family was given back in the 1600s. The king of Bavaria gave them the, uh, the uh, name uh, uh, Angreifer, attacker. And so crazy King Louis was involved, huh? Uh, it was... No, one King Louis, but I'm trying to remember who which king of Bavaria it was. Because Ludwig is the famous one that's crazy in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't Ludwig, but it might have been Ruprecht or Rudolph or one of them. I don't um, know. Back in the you know back in the days of the uh, uh, the Hundred Years' War, there were just so oh, many gotcha. municipalities Sooner. and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, he's he's a combination of George Patton and and. Sergeant Fury. <laughs> not Nick Fury, you know, not... Right. I don't know if you've ever read the Sergeant Fury mm -hmm. uh, comics, uh, but all of his commandos showed up in the first Captain America movie. Dum-dum mm -hmm. Dugan and all those guys. Right. Um, and so he's kind of a combination of all that stuff, and <laughs> I wrote him to be a serious character. He wasn't ever meant to be a caricature, but he does do some things that most people can't do. Uh, his best friend, Norm Fleming, is because there's a particular actor I just think is phenomenal, a man named Dennis Haysbert. The Allstate man? Oh, yes. Gotcha. I love him, and I love his voice. and I, I, mm -hmm. ever, I love everything he's ever done acting-wise. Mm -hmm. So he's one of the main characters, and uh, every time I would write a line of dialogue, I would think, how would Dennis Haysbert say that? You know, mm -hmm. Now, he can't sue me because his name doesn't appear anywhere. <laughs> and I never say, gee, you sound like Dennis Haber. But uh, hey, we're inspired by all kinds of things. If we I all got was. sued, there would be no fiction. It's true. And and the female characters are all um I really don't know, probably the women I've known in my life. Most of them are very strong. Mm -hmm. Uh one of them's nuts, but in a good way. Um Don't it, say who it is. I don't want you to get into trouble. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Oh, no. And if I said who, it, it, the character's name is uh, Nipple. And, <laughs> um, sorry. That's not her real name. That's no, no. They're her, soldiers, her, right? Yeah, they give each well, other names. She, she's not exactly. She's just, her brother is. And she's kind of <sighs> a tag along. And she just happens to be deadly. And she gets, <laughs> he saves her life and all that. And so uh, she likes to freak people out. And she likes mm -hmm. to throw it in their face. So she thought, hmm, what can I do that's really offensive? Yeah, that's a great name. Um, Everybody looks her steady in the eye when they call her name. <laughs> they do. But actually, you know, it's funny. You asked about research, and, and I know we're wrong, and I don't mean to, but um, <laughs> research is something I've gotten used to doing with uh, the World War II. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I do a lot of it every day. Um on that particular book and on that series, I still do a lot of research. And it goes down to things like one of the guys, uh, I got a bad review from somebody who argued with me that there's a particular helicopter in the books. And it said, you have it picking up an armored vehicle that weighs 30 tons and it couldn't lift that much. And I wrote him back. And I said, no, that armored vehicle only weighs 13 and it has a lift capacity of 18. You know, you need to, well, what did you use? And he sent me Wikipedia as his source. <laughs> You know, and you just want to go, Wikipedia is not a source. And it's so a I place to start. Back. Exactly. Look uh -huh. at the references for Wikipedia, yeah. and that might tell you some sources. Uh -huh. And so I sent him mine, and he was like, well, I don't believe yours. Uh, but for the most part, you do that. And then for writers in particular, mm -hmm. I think one of the least utilized tools we all have is uh, Google Street. Because in the second book, there is a fight that takes place in the Arizona desert at a particular intersection that really exists. 
And so I plopped myself down in that middle of that intersection and did a 360 degree scan nice. and just described the scene as I saw it. Clever. And you can do that. You can't do it everywhere because mm-hmm. not everywhere has a street that's had uh, a satellite you know, go down or somebody take a picture from there. And, mm-hmm. But you can do it probably 80% of the country. Hey. And it will help you. And you can describe all the little things you see mm-hmm. that you don't have to make them up. They're real. All you're doing is describing mm-hmm. what's already there. And it makes it a real place. And people who live there or close are going to write you and say, you know, you must live around here. You're like, this worked. It does. Yeah, it's it pretty really, cool. and, and you don't have to make any of it up. So it's kind of cheating. <laughs> well, that's why in my new book, I made Houston like one of the characters. You oh, know what I mean? It's like, okay. I know this city. And the parts I don't, I can go visit, you know, <laughs> so I it, can, I made this. But Google, that's very clever. No, Zafo, we can't do that. We have to go to Charleston to research my other book. I'm sorry. In Chicago, we have to actually go. Sorry. And, and, and by the way, you're going to Charleston. If you're going to go to Charleston, mm-hmm. you know, you need to see what Charleston looks like from Savannah. Oh, I've been to Savannah, too. I love oh. Savannah. I love it. But my this story takes place in Charleston. So oh, I, I was born Charleston. there, right? So I have oh, this like, really? connection. I, I was. Yeah. Charleston. Oh, I love Charleston. What a Me great too. Me, too. And my kids have never been. I'm like, we need to take them. But, you know pandemic so well of course and if you put the book there that's a giant tax deduction yeah that was kind of the plan too yeah but like you said it's one of those ideas that have been around in my head but i'm like but i need to walk the plantation again i need to walk so so my childhood memories are not actually you know are not necessarily as accurate as i would like them to be so i want to walk around and actually get it and and, you know you forget the smells and you forget uh the sounds and so Uh putting yourself in that place really if you can Mm-hmm. It really does give you some some details that you don't have to make up, but are very authentic. Exactly. Exactly. So yep. we will, just not yet. Okay. But I wasn't ready to write that anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> um, let's see. So we talked about Last Brigade, which I'm very excited to finish reading. Um, are there going to be any more books in the Time Wars series? Yes. Or is Jurassic Jail the only one? Because that's a fascinating concept the solving the murder of a fossil of the guy who's actually still alive i mean it's just it's incredible thank you i appreciate that and that's one that took you talk about ideas Mm -hmm. now i want to i don't know if you read the intro or if i put it in the intro because it's been a while Mm -hmm. that book actually predates jurassic park really it does i started writing that book in 1988 and among the titles i had several titles Mm -hmm. jurassic jail was one of them you know, gee, I don't know. And uh, I thought, Jurassic Jail? But then Jurassic Park comes out, and I thought, okay. Uh, he stole it. And I, I, he died for it. Uh, you can't patent an idea. That's one of the things you learn as a writer, too. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you know, and it's funny, because that's kind of the way my mind works, is what happens if this happens? Mm-hmm. And how do you prosecute someone for a murder that both happened 250 million years ago and hasn't happened yet. Yeah, it's just incredible. Uh, so there's going to be more so, books in that series? Oh, yeah. And uh, there's going to be... The next one actually has a title, and it's partly written, called Cretaceous Kill. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got a T-Rex on the cover, which might... Because that was not a T-Rex, by the way, on the cover of Jurassic Jail. That is not a T-Rex. That's an Allosaurus. I will take your word for it. And... Uh, then there's another one after that called Dark Time, mm-hmm. which I'm I'm also have another title in mind. But um, Cretaceous Kill, I'm actually writing with my publisher. Oh, interesting. She had came along with a plot, and I thought, wow, that that's great. And mm-hmm. so we're going to do that together. And then I don't I don't know if we'll do Dark Time together or not. But I would love to see both of those this year if I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually already have the cover for Cretaceous Kill. Just don't have the book. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. fun. You know, that's actually something I wanted to ask you too. You do a lot of cooperative work. So what do you see as being the benefit to working with other authors that way? I think for everybody, there's a big benefit. And mm-hmm. shared universes, I think, are uh, the way to build your brand. Now, if you're not Larry Correa or Jim Butcher or David Weber, mm-hmm. uh, Brandon Sanderson, um, the day we're still thinking that this is 2014 on Kindle on Amazon, and it's not. 
and things change. It, things have changed. Amazon's putting out a million self-published books a year. Mm -hmm. So how do you find readers among that sea of new publications that might want to read your book? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do advertising in some form or fashion. You're going to have to do all the usual stuff everybody else does, but you're doing what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways I think you can branch out of that is to find a successful shared universe or create a successful shared universe where maybe you're not going to make as much money because you're sharing the revenue with other authors, but you're going to find a much larger audience. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can sell enough books to compensate for that sharing. Right, which means you actually will make more money. Exactly. Right, it's kind of like the big box star things, right? Their stuff is cheaper. They have a lower profit per book or, you know, per sale, but they sell so many of them, they make exactly. more profit. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. yep. And so I think that right now, at, at this moment in time, I think that's where authors such as you and I mm -hmm. or your publishing company mm -hmm. have a chance. Uh, another publishing company that's doing a lot of this, that's very successful, who you know, you've met them, Mm -hmm. is Shadow Alley Press, mm -hmm. James Hunter, yep. Annette Strode. Uh, yep. uh, Chris is doing a lot of it. I'm doing a lot of it now with mm -hmm. The Last Brigade has got some. Time mm -hmm. Wars is a shared universe if anybody came to me with an idea. Nice. My fantasy series, which I absolutely love, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked about that. But I have another yeah. one called Shark Steel and High Adventure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how authors today is we can get out there and share each other's, um, not just your readership, because that's so mercenary, but you can go along and, and say, well, here's something that a friend of mine wrote, or here's something that we both wrote. And with Larry, uh, like with, with Hit World, with the bullet, uh, A Bullet for the Shooter, which is coming next month, mm -hmm. Larry had never written a novel before. Mm -hmm. I had. And so it was kind of a let me help sh I've got some ideas, so it's not all just his, his ideas. He had a lot of them, but I've got, I put some in too. But mm -hmm. it's also let me shepherd you through to the end on this mm -hmm. so that you'll, you can see the process, figure out how to do it, and now he's writing the sequel on his own. <laughs> and so there's a lot of that. Uh, yep. Kayla is a remarkable young lady, but I thought, you know, I don't know if I can teach her anything or not, but mm -hmm. I have been doing this a long time, and I've majored mm -hmm. in creative writing and all that stuff. Maybe I can. Um, and so I also like it. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I don't know. I just enjoy uh, co-writing with people, if they're the right people. Now, some people I don't right. necessarily. Yeah. You never know till you jump in, right? You know, Helen wants to know, how do you find collabs if you're not as cool as you, Bill? If we're not as cool as you are, how do we find them? First of all, you need to have your eyes checked. <laughs> it's not true. You're awesome, Bill. Okay, see, see to that tomorrow. <laughs> One of the problems you're going to have is you can't just take any collaborator. Mm -hmm. It's fine if you're doing it for an exercise. But one of the things I, this kind of goes into critique groups. And I don't believe in critique groups because I think critique groups operate at the level of the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. So if you've got four people reading your work and they're all giving opinions on what you should do with it, well, how do you know who's to actually listen to? Mm -hmm. Granted, you, it's up to you. You don't have to take any of their advice. But A, why would you slow down and get their input? Now, that doesn't go for if there are four peop three people or however many mm -hmm. who are more accomplished than you are. If right. Kevin J. Anderson wanted me to be in his critique group, I'm all over it. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, you know, the new guy who just decided to sit down and write a short story wants me to, what does he know about it? And it's, yep. there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not criticizing them, except you're taking advice from somebody who didn't know what they're talking about. Right. So it's kind of the same way with collaborating. Gotcha. And if David Weber or Eric Flint reaches out to me and, and Eric... I still will co-write that trilogy I owe you. <laughs> uh, See, Eric's pretty generous about working in his world. He, he is. He's, mm -hmm. he's really probably overstretched. Um, I'm oh, supposed yeah. I owe him a trilogy. Sounds like you're overstretched. Come on now. 
Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I relate. I totally relate. Obviously, he would be doing me a favor if I did that because I would be learning from him. Right. right. Process. And, and, mm-hmm. and it's not sentence construction or any no, of that. No, no, There's no, no. so much more to it. Right. And so uh, process is everything in mm-hmm. writing a book. And so I, I'm looking for people who might be able to uh, help out. I've got a couple of unpublished short stories that are going to be in anthologies that new people had. Mm-hmm. Very short, both of them. They'd never written anything before, but and they were very rough. But the ideas were great. So I said, let me rewrite it using your, all your ideas, as much of your language as we can, mm-hmm. and then you'll see what you like. And I did that on both of them, and I think what I was able to show them is how to see how to point of view, especially. Right. It's hard for young writers. Oh, it and really? So I think is. they were able to understand point of view a little bit better. Good. Yeah, as an editor, I find that a lot, a lot, a lot. And, and I write, uh, although Trash Man is first person, it's one of the very few first persons I've done. Mm-hmm. Most of mine are third person limited. Mm-hmm. And third person limited is great. But it's limited. <laughs> right. For and a so reason. People, and so many people switch back to third-person omniscient, to third-person mm-hmm. limited, and back yeah. and forth. And, and they get it mixed up, and they're not really sure. So yeah. I really don't want to be going – I don't really want to be an editor when I co-write with someone. That sounds fair. You need someone I, I, with – so when you're looking for a collaborator, find someone with about equal experience is what you're saying. I like that. Uh, with writing, anyways, if not less. publishing. I don't mind a little bit less. Mm-hmm. All right? But – what I don't want to do is go back to having to correct every single sentence where, you know, he did this, you know, he, he walked up the stairs, he opened the door, he walked across the room. <laughs> it's like, he, ah, ah. Up the drawers, he opened the top drawer. He looked through his underwear. He <laughs> found the gun underneath. <laughs> but it's funny. I am laughing so hard because it's funny you say that we've all done it. Like that's the beginner oh, yeah. writer thing. Yes. And then you realize, oh, wait, I don't have to say every single thing that happens. <laughs> Who knew? <Yes. laughs> it's so funny. But just it's all these learning things there. And I think sometimes when I give people critique, because, uh, you know, I, I edit, I freelance edit, too. So when I'm giving them the critique and telling them about that, sometimes I don't think I, I make sure to stress that this is a common issue. Right. So they don't think I'm picking on them because they're like, why are you tearing apart all of my stuff? I'm like, no, no, yeah. this is common. I did it, too. Common issue. Chris Easy to fix, just, too. <laughs> Chris was just making fun of me today about commas. So, you know. <laughs> okay, I leave that to the copy editor. Well, yeah, I, you know, I did not say, isn't that Maya's job? But, See? Uh, yeah, that's you know, what I would Because Maya keeps saying, no, that's not my job. You should know this. <laughs> Since you know Maya, then, you Yes, know. yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's your job, Maya. Fix it for me. Um. <laughs> So I think um, we are about done tonight. You are awesome, Bill. So I have well, my final I, question. I'd like to know where can fans find you and your work? Um, my work is on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, William Allen Webb. And my website is thelastbrigade.com. If you go to there, you're going to see this giant picture of books. <laughs> and you'll know you're in the right place. Uh, in case there's another The Last Brigade dot something or other. Excellent. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm strictly on Amazon. Um, that's probably, uh, but it is what it is for now. Yeah. No, I feel you. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bill. It's so been please, fun. everyone get Bill's books and leave him a review. Writers love reviews. And also please leave this podcast a review wherever you get your podcasts or you can, uh, follow us on, um, whatever this is, Twitch. Follow us on Twitch and you can subscribe on YouTube and we would love to hear from you. So thank you very much. We'll see you next time. And next time is a special one because it's the release of my new book, The Collector. So that'll be fun.